welcome. My name is Grace Hallbury. I am a research coordinator for the Rotan Marine Park and I run the Asexual Coral Restoration Program. We have been running for about um, three years now. So I thought it would be really nice for us to kind of get together in West End with the dive community and talk about all the stuff that we've been doing in the past few years. Um, so first, first um, I'm going to talk a little bit about RMP and who we are. So we have a mission that is to inspire, educate and empower communities and visitors to conserve and protect marine environments for the benefit of all. We've been around since 2015. Um, and we, uh, 20, 2005 even, even uh, and we are a non-profit, non-governmental organization um, in Honduras and also a 501c in the U US. Um, this, we started essentially because of a, um, the, there was a marine protected area that ran from Sandy Bay to West Bay that was essentially um, completely unregulated. It was essentially just a paper park. No one was actually enforcing the rules. So a group of local dive shop owners and local stakeholders got together and created RMP um, to help enforce these rules. Since then, um, the marine protected area has spread, spread to the entire of the island. And then afterwards, to the, in 2010, the um, Bay Islands National Marine Park was instated. That is not just Roatan, but the two other islands, Utila and Guanaja. Um, we are co-managers of the Bay Islands National Marine Park. This means we work with other NGOs and also governmental institutions to help reinforce and work ma and maintain the marine park. Okay, we, we have various different programs that we do. First and foremost, we have the patrols program. So we have patrol, about five patrol boats all over the island. Uh, they are, they have park rangers on them, which are patrolling, making sure that the rules and regulations of the marine park are enforced. And as I mentioned before, we are an NGO. So we don't actually have the legal authority to arrest anybody. So we work with the Honduran Navy and there are naval officers on the boat as well. Um, and they are the ones that actually have the legal authority to, um, to enforce the law. Um, uh, we also do marine infrastructure. Um, so all of those mooring lines and buoys that you see out around, those are actually created and maintained and installed by us at RP. This is a public service that we provide. Anyone and anyone can tie up to these mooring lines, dive shop owners, kayakers, snorkels, tour boats, whatever. This is in order to prevent people from throwing anchor onto the reef and damaging it, which is also illegal. Uh, we also have outreach and education. We work with local schools, going to give them talks to the children, teaching them about the reef and marine ecosystems. Um, and we, to even take them out on excursions into the water. A lot of them, unfortunately, a lot of the children can't swim, so we actually take them out on the glass bottom boat. This gets them to actually see the reef for the first time ever. Um, and so they have a connection to what we're talking about when we come and talk to them about it as well. We also work in alternative livelihoods. Um, we help provide alternative livelihoods to fishing. So we have a our Protect Our Pride program. This is um, where we take local local people and train them from open water diver all the way up to um, instructor so that they can earn their living off the reef but not by fishing. Um, and there's many, many other examples. And finally, we have the research program. Can you actually see green, by the way? Yeah? Okay, cool. I can't. Um, <laughs> we have the research program. So we, we work in various different areas. We have a uh, marine turtle monitoring, a marine megafauna citizen science program, which you can see this poster for right here. Um, uh, we study fish spawning aggregations. Uh, we uh, help control the invasive lionfish population by issuing lionfish hunting licenses. And then we have coral restoration. That's really what we're here to talk about today. 
Um, we have asexual carousation, and now, which I will mention later on in the presentation, we also have uh, sexual carousation coming up in our lives. Um, so, we can talk a little bit about what corals are, just for those who might not be familiar. Um, a, co a coral is not a plant, it is not a rock, it is an animal. It is a very tiny invertebrate that believes begins life as a single polyp. There is a diagram right here, but I don't know if you can see it because it's fun. But basically, um, a colony of corals is a lot, a lot of different polyps. Um, these are these teeny tiny little invertebrates that have tentacles that have stinging cells on them um, that they can um, catch uh, phytoplankton in the water column in order to eat. Um, they belong to the same phylum as a family as jellyfish and anemones. And they also, stony corals, secrete a hard inner skeleton of calcium carbonate, also known as limestone. This is what makes up the skeleton of the reef. This is the backbone of the reef that we see out there is created through the secretion of this hard outer inner skeleton. Um, they also have this very, very cool little symbiotic relationship with a thing called zooxanthellae. Zooxanthellae are a kind of algae, um, and they, they live within the tissue of the corals, and they have a really nice little symbiotic relationship by which they, um, they, um, they are, they, through photosynthesis, they provide nutrients for the corals, and in exchange, the corals give them a safe place to live. Um, this is actually what happens when corals bleach. It is not actually the coral dying. It is the coral getting really stressed out by heat or whatever, or a combination of things, that it actually ejects the zooxanthellae from technical issue. Okay. Um, when corals bleach, it's actually then ejecting zooxanthellae. So zooxanthellae are actually what give it color. So when corals eject that zooxanthellae, they lose their color, but they are still alive. There is still living tissue there. When corals bleach, they are not actually dead. Um, so a little bit of just general knowledge. Coral reefs actually cover less than one of them of the ocean floor, but are home to maybe 25% of marine life. Um, and a cluster of polyps, so it's a colony, so a coral colony that you see out there is a cluster of lots and lots of different polyps. And then a cluster of colonies is what we see out there, the coral reef. Um, corals have two different ways to sexually reproduce. It's very, very cool. They have their standard sexual reproduction, which they do through spawning. And actually, my colleagues are out right now watching, um, doing some coral spawning monitoring for the grooves of rain coral. It's very exciting. Basically, they eject or they spawn these gametes, which are the sperm and egg bundles. These float about in the water column and they mix together with the gametes from, it, from a different colony and they, they fertilize and then they float in the water as a little larvae for a few weeks before settling on the reef. Um, it should be noticed that a colony is that they a colony grows by cloning itself essentially. So every single polyp in the colony is genetically identical. So it needs to reproduce with a different colony. Um, so it's great if it spawns, but if there's nothing nearby, then unfortunately they're not going to be able to actually end up reproducing. So that's one of the difficulties. That there's always a risk when it comes to spawning. Not all, they don't always spawn at the same time. They do normally, but you know there's variations like in you know hours and stuff. And then there's the second way, which is asexual, which is also called fragmentation. This is what happens when basically a piece of coral breaks off from the main colony. It essentially regresses to its juvenile state where it's able to grow more quickly and grow a lot faster and then settle on the reef again and basically create its own new brand new colony. It's still identically identical to the previous colony, but it's creating its own colony. So, um, but once if a piece of coral breaks off, it can kind of survive and grow spread. Um, what is coral restoration? So in asexual coral restoration, we focus on that fragmentation. 
that's what we do. We essentially are breaking up bits of healthy coral that are collected off the natural reef, cutting them to, into really small pieces with the species that we use. It's kind of usually around the size of my index finger. Then we hang them in a, in a nursery, um, let them grow for a while, we maintain the nursery, keep it clean, make sure they don't get, get diseases or anything. We're trying not to get them, get them diseases. And then once they're big enough, within about, depending on the species again, within about a year or nine months, they're big enough, we can then outplant them onto the reef where they can settle and grow and restore the reef. Oh my god. Okay. The Rotan Marine Park Coral Restoration Project. So, uh, the goals for our project, we started in 2019 around, the, around this time, uh, which means we've been going for three years, as I've mentioned. Uh, the goals for the project were to install, maintain a coral nursery, to preserve, propagate, and outplant a proper corals in order to restore these keystone species to the reefs around the Rotan, and also to educate locals and tourists alike about the coral conservation through participation. So, I mentioned, I just mentioned a species there. This is a species called a Acropora. Um, there's three species in that. I have the Latin names up there and I'll tell you the common names. Uh, we have, you might know them by their common names, which is staghorn and elkhorn coral. This is also Acropora cervicornis. This looks a lot like fingers. It's, quite, it's a dark, dark brownie orange usually. And it grows in these kind of clusters of fingers. And then we have elkhorn corals, which are a bit more kind of plating grow and they look like the horns of an elk, hence the name. Um, and then we have the super secret hybrid. So there's actually three species. Um, the hybrid is when the staghorn and elkhorn sexually spawn and set the fertilize each other's gametes and it creates a hybrid species. It's really, really cool. Um, in general, uh, uh, the palmata, the elkhorn, tends to be in the shallower reefs of up to 15 feet. They really like that reef crest where there's lots of water bashing about, lots of currents and um, waves. And a proper cervicorn is the, the, the staghorn, tends to be a little bit lower from 15 feet downwards to 60 feet. And it's, um, but they are both dominant space occupiers on the reef, or they were. Um, because sadly, um, both of these species are critically endangered by the IUCN red list. This means they've had, throughout Florida and the Caribbean, their populations have, just, have had about 97% decreases. Um, and it's for a variety of reasons. There has been various different uh, diseases that have affected them and also just the general issues that affect climate change and pollution and all this is practical. Um, as I said, they are dominant space occupiers. This means that they're also keystone species. Um, this means that if they disappear from an ecosystem, the rest of the food chain kind of, can, there could be collapses, there can be real significant effects. They're really important to the reef because they are this kind of branching corals. They add a lot of like, um, verbosity to the reef. They add a lot of texture, as it were. Um, this means they provide really their habitats for a lot of creatures, especially smaller creatures that want to hide from bigger predators. They can hide between the, the branches of the corals um, and animals can lay their eggs in there as well. All sorts of things. They are really, really important. But sadly, they are critically endangered, which is why they are a very, very good species to, um, to focus on for car restoration because they are so important and also because they grow relatively fast for so many corals. So a couple of corals actually grow at the rate of about 10 to 20 centimeters in a year. That might sound slow to you and me, but compared to uh, other species like brain corals and uh, older corals and all those species, they grow at about one centimeter a year. So they grow very, very fast in relative to other species of stony corals. Okay, so those are the species that we use. I'm now gonna talk about the nursery and what we do there. 
Um, we use teak trees in our nursery. There are various different actually forms of doing this. So we actually ended up following uh, the Car Restoration Foundation's uh, methodology when we first started out, just because they have many, many years worth of experience and we were a brand new project. So we were following their um, methodologies. And so they use structures they call trees. It's essentially a trunk of PVC pipe with fiberglass um, rods sticking out as branches. And then the fragments are hung using monofilaments on the branches where they can grow safely. Um, there's, you can also use rebar structures called A-frames that are literally in the shape of an A, or also um, domes, cables, not just a PVC, but also a rebar. There are also things called like rope trees where they hang ropes up in the water column. There's lots and lots of different ways to do it. But we have gone for trees. We started out in 2019 with 10 trees. And now we have 40. Um, we have, in our nursery, we have over 1,400 fragments hanging in our trees. Um, I can't tell you how many we had when we first started up the project because we weren't taking that much data back then, um, but we've increased a lot since then. Uh, we've also outplanted around 1,200 fragments. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, Uh, each tree has a different potential genotype. Um, that means that they are genetically different from each other. Um, like I said, co a colony is genetically identical with all the polyps inside of it. Um, so that would be one genotype, whereas a separate colony that has, is a genetically different um, is a different genotype. These are really important to think about because um, if we're able to differentiate genotypes, we can tell which ones are faster growing, uh, more resistant to heat, more resistant to disease, and thereby make our program as, as efficient as possible. Um, so each of our trees is a different potential genotype. We have not actually done genetic testing yet um, on, our, on our trees, but we are planning to in the very near future, so we're very, very excited about those results. Um, of these putative genotypes, which is like potential genotypes, of the palm of the so the corners, the stagpole, we have 26 different genotypes. Um, of the alkyl, we have five, and of the hybrid, we have another five. Um, those of you who are good at maths will notice that that does not add up to 40. Um, that is because we have a few empty trees at the moment, um, mostly because we have been. Um, getting rid of a lot of our palmata, outplanting it, trying to um, take it out of the trees, just because it hasn't been very, very happy in the trees. It's not growing very fast. And um, we've been having a lot of problems and it generally just seems much happier on the reef. So we are just trying to move it out and then hopefully in the future, we'll have a better plan for it, which I will get to um, But also, yeah. Um, we go to the nursery. I go to the nursery about once a week. Um, each tree needs to be cleaned at least once a month. This involves not just cleaning those little monofilaments that attach the, the, attach the coral fragment to the tree, um, but also the branches, the trunk, all those the ropes and the floats that attach the tree to the ground. Um, they're like uh, they're like a massive beacon for bivalves and other invertebrates. You see all sorts of really cool stuff there. We want to kind of not have too much of it there because especially as close to the corals as possible, we don't want algae and other stuff there because it will impede the growth of the corals. And um, when we're there, we also have to often want to do a lot of maintenance. So some of our trees have been there for over three years now. They're starting to get a little bit raggedy, especially with the weight of the corals on them. But sometimes we have to replace them. Um, we have to replace branches, we have to, sometimes the, the monofilaments break, we have to take them. We also like to refrag um, our trees as they're growing. Um, often they're not completely full in space, um, and we, as the corals grow and they get bigger, we cut a little piece off it, 
and we hang it in the tree and thereby fill the tree and create more and more fragments from the original fragments. Um, we also do a lot of monitoring of data. We take a lot of data of each tree. Um, we, we monitor how many fragments are on the tree so we can have a good general number of how many fragments in total we have. Um, we have we track how many dead fragments there might be on the tree. Hopefully, it's usually zero, but not always. Uh, we also track about diseases. There's various different diseases that affect the problem. Questions at the end. Thank you. No, we'll do it. See a difference. Hold on, there's a microphone. Do you see a difference in the tree from the top to the bottom in growth uh, or how quick they grow and also in uh, Um, Not really, no. Um, the trees are not that tall. I mean, they're probably about two meters smaller than that. Um, so that difference in depth or anything, um, we don't really see it. Uh, we also don't, but um, we don't actually outplant any fragments from those bottom rows. So they're often a lot bigger than the rest of it because we don't cut them because we want them to grow bigger so that they reach sexual maturity and hopefully spawn. Maybe what happened this year, we'll see next month. Um, so it's kind of hard to tell, but in general, not really, there's not really much difference. Um, so yes, we monitor for various different diseases um, and we, we monitor their bleaching. We want to make sure that they're not getting too warm in the water as temperatures start to rise like we do now. We want to make sure that we, we monitor the color, we have the scale, and then also our plantability, which is a word that I know about this today. Um, we, Basically, we want to we keep a tally um, of how many corals, how many fragments in each tree are ready to outplant. And when we outplant our corals, we don't actually take the whole fragment out of the tree. What we do is we want to, we're looking for the number of corals that will still have a decent sized fragment left, but we can take a nice, um, decent sized piece, which is about the size of my hand. Um, and we count those in tens as well. So we outplant in tens. So we, have, in our database, it's not really useful to us to know there's 14 on such a tree. So we do it in tens or twenties. Or so if there's 19, it's actually we count those in ten, and so on. Um, this is all stuff we do on a very regular basis, um, and um, is super fun. Um, so, um, how is our coral collected? There's two different ways of collecting corals. Um, we have to originally take corals from the reef in order to fill our trees, of course. So there's two different ways. Um, what we tend to do is called fragments of opportunity. Um, this is fragments that have naturally broken off in the, in the ocean, usually due to storms or um, various things maybe you're going to boat running in the reef. Um, these events cause fragments of coral to break off. When we become aware of these things, we go out, we collect it, we cut, cut it up into small fragments, and we hang it in our trees. And that's how we get new colonies in our trees. So if you see it, let me know. Um, another version that's um, also an option is cutting from a, from a large, healthy colony. Um, where you can only take less, 10% or less than a of the colony, so it needs to be quite a decent sized one. Um, if you're taking that small amount, it can still grow up because you are cutting it. That bit that's cut, that's still part of the coral, that will still that will grow faster because it's recovering from being cut. Um, so the, the corals can still recover. Um, uh, and now, I'm just, so this. Is a really nice map that you can see really, really well. Uh, but basically, this is really annoying. Sorry. Uh, this is the map of the east, the west of Rotan, um, with lovely little dots where everywhere we've collected different genotypes. Um, I can share the photo if you want to see it later. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Um, 
Yeah. So this is probably like Bear's Den is probably the fish in Bear's Den is probably the noisiest noise. All the way down here to the point, we've got a few over there. There's the these color coordinated for the different species as well. Um, and quite a bit down in the south is where we have got quite a few of our uh, genotypes, specifically 11, because it's a really, really cool place called Cordelia Banks. Um, I don't know if you've all heard of Cordelia Banks, but Cordelia Banks is a really, really, really special place. It is one of the highest coral cover percentages of the entire Caribbean and South American reef. Um, it is one of the places on the Mesoamerican Reef that has the highest level of acropora. It is just basically acropora as far as the eye can see. It is this lovely little bank. It is beautiful. It is incredibly highly protected and we've worked very, very hard to get it there because we want to keep it that way. Um, it is literally just south of Cox and Hall. So it's um, really surprising. It's in such an amazing state considering how much cruise ships and pollution kind of pass by. Uh, it's really, really cool. It's a really beautiful place. And we have done in the past year two trips to Cordelia um, to collect fragments from there. That is a picture of people looking very happy doing that, but we can't see it because it's like. <laughs> um, so out planting. Once our corals are growing big and nice and strong, we want to out plant them onto the reef. Because that is the whole goal of this project is to restore the reef. So once they've got big enough, we like, we like to outplant them. This is a video that you guys can't see. You can see it? Okay, good. Yeah. So this is a video basically of someone outplanting coral. We use um, a, an epoxy to coral this. There's various different methods. Some people like to actually use nails and zip ties. Um, other people use cement. We use epoxy and we find it efficient. It works for us. You get those, those fragments. This is the stag one. So what you want is you want a piece that has like a nice three points of contact with the reef. Um, before the stage, you actually get a hammer and you hammer the reef and you kind of scrape up the, the turf algae and you want to break up the substrate a little bit so it's rough. So it will attach to the, the epoxy actually attaches to the reef. Um, the epoxy sticks really, really well to the coral, the trick. And it's surprisingly hard. It looks really easy. It's really quite difficult. The trick is getting it to attach to the reef and stay there. Um, so yeah, we kind of you make these little poxy balls and you stick the, um, the fragment on there. And hopefully it stays. Um, so in 2019, which was the first year of our program, we are planted 17 fragments. Last year, we are planted 701. Um, we obviously, our program has grown significantly in the past few years, and in total, over 1,200 corals have been really returned to the reef so far. Our outplant site is um, across three different dive sites um, in between West End and West Bay. Um, it is essentially um, Chief's Quarters, Dara Street, and Shallow Tunnel Crossing. All throughout there, if you're diving, you'll see lots of little clusters. Of the Crumpera, and those will be our planted plants. Um, yes, Mike, we did a question. I think you guys um, choose that. So we chose it because of um, there's actually a really big, nice stack on cluster there already. Um, and just like the has a really, really big, nice blue sack that is degraded enough that it's worth us coming in and restoring it. Um, and also it has the right, like it has um, the right kind of level of, kind of CCA, which is a calcium, sorry, cal calcerous coralline algae, which is this kind of little, really tiny algae that is really great and the corals really like stick into it. So it had a nice number of that. It had a, Decent, like the benthic populations of species was the right thing. We, um, uh, so yeah, there was a various number of reasons, but it's worked out really well. Okay. 
So that was a big reason why we managed to do 700 pearls in 2021. And that is because we had this wonderful event called Coral Mania in December of last year. It was really, really fun. Uh, we outplanted a uh, certain corner, so the staghorn corals. Um, and we outplanted 360 fragments in three days. Uh, it was really, really intense. This was part of an international event organized by the German Corporation, which included organizations from Honduras, Costa Rica, and the Dominican Republic, all of us in the same week outplanting as many corals as we could. Um, it was a really, really, really fun event, and we got to a lot of outplanting done, and it's really cool. We had the help of uh, around 26 different people, and it was a really, really great event. And it's happening in November of this year, Carl Mania 2022. So, um, R&P, as ourselves, don't actually do a lot of outplanting anymore because we, um, as part of our goals, we want to in incorporate locals and tourists alike into the into the project, teaching them how to how to um, uh, work in the nursery and outplant, and teaching them all about corals and coral restoration. So we developed the Rotan Marine Park Coral Restoration Certification. There are two different versions of the course. We have the adventurer, which is a theory class, and then just the one diet and, and doing the nursery. And then we have the full version, which is theory class, a nursery diet, where you learn how to clean the trees, refrag fra um, fragments, cut fragments, hang fragments, take data, all sorts of things. It's really fun. And then on the second diet, we go out and we outplant a cluster of fragments. Uh, it's very, very cool. And we have had this started in 2020. Um, and since then, we have trained over 100 students and we have seven different instructors trained. Uh, this course is offered at four different plant centers in West End. We have sun divers, we have rare tree divers, coconut tree, and also reef divers where we are right now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, monitoring. So, we don't just chuck corals out onto the reef and then never think about them again. Um, we go back and we monitor, and we monitor quite thoroughly. Um, first and foremost, when people go out and outplant, we go out the the in dive shops when they go out planting in the course. They go out within a week afterwards just to make sure that the epoxy has set and that all the pieces are attached because it takes about 24 hours for the support to dry so sometimes there's surge or something and things get knocked off. Um, and then also us at RMP, we do monitoring at one month, six months, 12 months and 24 months. It's really important for us to do this because we're able to identify a which species, which genotypes are doing better on the reef and are resisting, um, resisting disease and growing more but also just to see how effective and efficient our efforts are overall. If we're just throwing a bunch of corals into the reef and then they're just immediately dying, then we're not actually achieving our goal of restoring the reef. And it's a waste of time, it's a waste of money, it's a waste of, um, of everything. So we want to make sure that what we're doing is actually making a difference. So we go out and we monitor. And we manage we measure for survival. So we want to see how many of those fragments have survived, are still alive. Uh, we want to make sure test for any um, see if there's any diseases. Uh, we want to see how much they're growing, and we also want to take photos so that we can do comparisons. Um, <clears throat> so we've actually changed our monitoring methodology over the years. When we first started, we were actually monitoring growth by. In this photo here, you can see someone using a ruler to measure a fragment. We have two tags on each cluster, which are attached to, attached to two different fragments. This helps us identify what genotype and which cluster or from that genotype that cluster is. Um, and what we originally did to measure growth was to measure the maximum length of that fragment um, and average the two together and that would be the average length of all of the fragments in the in the cluster. Um, 
this isn't hugely scientific. And unfortunately, we kind of realized that um, there was a lot of differentiation of what people class as uh, the maximum length of fragments. And sometimes the tag would fall off and we put the tag on another fragment. And so like the, the lengths would increase and decrease at very strange rates. So uh, in the last few months, we've actually shifted and we are now taking photos with a measuring stick, which you can see sort of here. Um, we place the measuring stick in the middle of the cluster and we take a photo from above. That measuring stick um, is 50 centimeters long and each gap, so there's black electrical tape every 10 centimeters. So each, each gap is 10 centimeters. We can use that in a really nifty software um, to actually measure the total area in centimeters squared of that entire cluster. And we can use that number to measure how much um, area on the reef um, is being restored by being covered by this coral um, over time. And it's really, really cool. So we don't have a lot of results on that yet because we've only just started. Um, but that's really, really exciting for the future. I can't wait to see how, 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 um, what happens. Um, so just an example of how much these corals um, grow. This is a, um, APRO 136, so that's the Copper and Prolifera, the hybrid, genotype 136, plus a one, I don't know what else is one of six, apologies. Um, that cluster is now two years old. Um, it was outplanted in 2020. Sadly, I don't have a photo of it then, but I do have it at one year old in June 2021 and at two years old in June 2022. I don't know if you can, see, you can see the difference in the photo. Yeah, so you can see the kind of the fragments so like here, here, there's one here, there's one here, one here. Um, and then over here, it's literally, it's all fused together. Like all the fragments eventually as they grow, this is one of the big goals we want, because they're the same genotype, as they grow to together, they're gonna fuse and they'll become one large fragment, become one large colony. And that's what's happened already with this, um, with this cluster. And it's really, really pretty. Um, and it's now, it's now two colonies. Eventually it will grow and it will cover the whole thing. Um, and I mean, it's about, I'd say tripled in size in just a year. Yes, question. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering with this species specifically, is the, the hybrid offspring viable? Can it produce truly past that first generation? So um, it cannot sexually reproduce with itself, and originally it thought it was a mule. Um, but there's actually a study that came out last year, I believe, that uh, suggests that um, it can sexually reproduce back with staghorn and alcorn. So it's not actually um, sterile. So it's really, really good. And there's also, the reason we have some in the nursery as well is that it's, it tends to be, it can be, it's been shown to be more successful than actually sometimes the other species in coral, um, in coral restoration projects. Um, it's really, it's, you know, has that kind of like hybrid vigor. So it's just a little bit more resistant to disease, a little bit more resistant to heat. Okay. Um, so that's why we really like it. And as you can see, it grows really well. Yes, Patrick. Yes, yes. Um, so um, I don't know for sure, but I, th I think the cervicomics grows slightly faster, but it's it's pretty on par um, with the cervical And uh, you said the right type. You assume that they will grow together to be one colony. That's what we're hoping, yeah. But we see other corals in between. Yes. So, I mean, they may not, but um, they have already fused together, as it were. They could go there. 
Um, obviously, I mean, colony, colors can sometimes quite easily coexist like that. Maybe, yes. We don't know. That is nature, and we can't control nature better. <laughs> you can see the screen now. How exciting. Okay, so these are a little bit of the results that we've had from our plant monitoring. So um, out of the 89 clusters that we have frag uh, monitored at the one month, 94% of those fragments are still alive. So the way we map measure um, the survival rate of the fragments is quite a simple metric. It's basically just how many out of the 10 fragments are still alive. Um, so 94% is basically 94% of all of the fragments in all those clusters are still alive after one month. After six months, it goes down to 85. That's a, the 88 fragment clusters we've, um, we've monitored. 12 months, it's 87. And then at 24 months, it's 74. However, uh, you'll notice that only 10 clusters that have been monitored at 24. Literally, the first we started out planting at this site in June of 2020. So it's these next couple of months are going to be a lot of the two year, 24 month monitoring, which is really exciting. Um, so that number is not necessarily, so it's not necessarily that accurate because the, the sample is just too small. Um, four clusters have actually died completely, unfortunately, which is very sad. Um, but at four out of over 100, it's pretty good, I think. Um, and in terms of disease and predators, we've had a significant amount. Um, almost all the trees in the nursery have had fireworms predation, have had predation on them. Um, and But um, most of them have been successful against fighting off diseases. We're seeing something slightly different in the outparts, but we don't have enough data to really fully um, make a, an accurate analysis of that yet. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is basically, I mean, 74% might sound kind of low, but none of these files would be there if they weren't for the, what we were doing. So um, even if it's 74% alive, that's still 74% more-ish, not really, but um, so like, all the corals that are still alive wouldn't have been there with, when, were it not for this project because um, we're cutting these fragments up into small pieces so they grow faster, create more fragments, much more than they would do naturally. So, uh, uh, what are we doing in the future? We have lots and lots of really fun plans. The next couple of years are going to be really, really interesting. Um, so um, we want to build upon what we're doing in the um, outplant monitoring, we're using taking those photos. We want to make that actually build upon that, expand upon it, and actually into photogrammetry. Um, if you want to know more about photogrammetry, I suggest you talk to Patrick, he knows a lot about it. But basically, we want to take one giant photo of the output site. And you do this by kind of taking lots and lots and lots and lots of photos of the entire tire, the entire reef. And there's a really cool software that stitches all these photos together. So you get one giant image, um, really high resolution of the reef itself. And then we can use that to actually measure um, all of the, the fragments all at once in the same in photo and see how what is the total amount of reef restored in centimeter square or meter squared. Um, this means that we don't we have it's it means we have to spend less time in the water. We still go and do monitoring of survival and diseases and stuff like that, but then we don't have to spend time taking all the photos to get the right things for the thing. We already do that at once a year or whatever. Um, so that's really exciting. Hopefully soon we'll be able to do that. Um, and then we're also going to be looking into 
for fragmentation. So as I mentioned, our elk horn is really not happy in our trees. What we want to do is we're going to build some tables. Actually, we've already built some tables. Um, and we're going to put them in tables that are much shallower depth um, and throw them onto these, um, grow elk horn on those tables. And then what we'll do is instead of, um, we'll take much smaller pieces um, kind of mini frags or micro fragmentation, mini fragments, and we'll outplant those directly onto the roof because studies and evidence shows that elk horn is actually much, much happier on the reef than it is in nurseries. So, and it's much happier on a flat surface than down in trees. So that's what we're going to do. We also want to move into kind of boulder coral, something I haven't mentioned at all in this talk is something called stony coral tissue loss disease. You might have mentioned it and you might have heard of it. It's a, a disease that affects um, over a third of the stony corals available here in the Rotan and the Greater Caribbean. Um, it has been quite, quite lethal and decimated our reefs, essentially. Um, Acropora, the species I've been talking about today, are not affected by the disease, which right? is why I haven't talked about it. But there are a lot of other species of stony corals that are now have had significant declines in their um, in the in the populations, so we want to kind of do something about this one. Um, do we want to we want to start with boulder corals and start doing micro fragmentation of boulder corals, which is just cutting them into really really small pieces as they grow, and then as they grow, we stick them onto the roof. We like stick them onto like concrete cookies essentially, and then those we stick onto the roof. Um, so hopefully in the next few months we'll be able to sort that out as well. And then I mentioned that my colleagues were currently doing some coral spawning monitoring. Um, this month is a very exciting month because we're actually going to be hopefully getting some participating in some assisted sexual fertilization. That's basically when we catch the gametes. This is a very very coral spawning right there. And that, that's here in Rotan last month. Um, what happens is we those are the walls, those are the gametes that keep sperm and egg bundles. We catch those using a net, we take them back, we mix them together with all the other colonies that spawned uh, to basically increase the rate of sexual fertilization. Um, and then um, we can, um, the idea is that we're going to have these structures called cribs, which are coming in September, um, and that we are going to. Um, Create, we're going to have all the, the, the larvae which have been fertilized in this container with the substrates on the bottom. Um, that looks like this. Um, these are little substrates. This is an overheat right now. So I don't know if anyone's going to overheat recently. Um, but we have these are actually my elk one tables, which are currently holding these until September. Then we're going to have. Take these. What we're, we're doing with this is we're trying to get the, 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 the substrate pieces to create, collect that CCA, that, that coralline algae that the corals really, really like to settle in. Um, so they're going to, they're out there now, so they've got a few months to settle. Um, so if you see it, please don't touch it. Um, and yeah, we're going to be hopefully collecting some uh, some some fertilizer and collecting and fertilizing some some baby baby corals and help helping them settle on these on these substrates. Um, this is all something that's going to be happening in the next few months, and it's very very exciting. Um, these substrates, once they've spent some time, once the, the the coral larvae have settled on the substrate. You can then take those pieces and put them out onto the roof and out part them essentially. Um, and hopefully, um, up to, to restore the reef after the, the devastation of SUTLD. Um, so, yeah, big thanks to. Um, everyone on this page, uh, all the dive centers through Marlin from here, and also to Mark Bund and Martua, who are the people who have our grant. And yes, any questions? Yeah, where does your funding come from? 
Um, currently, it comes from Mark One. We have a project that's closing soon. Um, we also, through the car restoration course, so part of the price of the course is a donation to RMP that helps us fund that project as well. Um, and we're looking into further forms of funding soon. Yeah, has there been a talk of participation space? Um, that's a different thing. So basically, because so we have our user bracelets. Yeah, if you want to use the microphone so the people online can hear you as well. Um, so this lady's asking about the uh, have a potential of having an entrance fee. Um, we have our user fee, which is voluntary because we are an NGO. We are not the government. So we can't actually charge a compulsory user fee to enter the marine park. If we had that, it would all go to the government and not to us. I'm not sure how much of that would actually go into conservation. Um, so yeah, any other questions? Morgan, you had a question. Can you see the map? No. Yeah. <laughs> I spent a long time on this map. <laughs> Is there any other questions? What's that? Oh, it's gone too far. Okay, this is my map. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is Cordelia Banks, and then we have uh, Smith Banks and Little Cordelia, which is smaller banks, kind of similar, but that's, that's quite familiar. Um, and yeah, this is, that's West Bay, um, here's West End, so we have them scattered about, the purple is the Elkhorn, the Pahata, the orange is the Serba Cornice, the, El um, the Saghorn, and then the green is the prolifera. Most of our prolifera has come from Cordelia, but we do have one, which is the one we looked at the nice big picture of um, that comes from there. Which I'm not sure what does that is, actually. Yeah. Ooh, yes. It's from David Ross. He says, do you have any plans to do any land-based microfragmentation? Any interest in setting up a protein bank system? Um, so we are trying to have a we have built a car restoration education center, which in the long term will hopefully be able to have um we're just waiting on permits to be able to actually have an ex city or land-based coral nursery and doing micro fragmentation um with that. Obviously, um a part of microfragmentation with boulder corals is you have to actually cut them up using a tile saw, so that involves taking them out of the water temporarily. Um, but again, we need permits for this, so this is all in the near future, hopefully. Um, and as for a gene bank, um, not necessarily. We do collaborate a lot with the other organizations on the island. There are three other organizations on the island that also do coral restoration. There's Beaker. Um, there's the Bay Island Reef Restoration in Turquoise Bay, and then there's also RIMS, the Rotan Institute of Marine Sciences, which is located in Anthony's Key. Um, we do quite a lot of genotype sharing throughout that, so there's kind of backups. Um, and we like to share, you know, our really successful genotypes, they're doing really well, we'll be like, well, this is a really good one, take it and do. Um, but as such as yet, no plans for the gene bank. Another question. <laughs> it's also from David Glass and he says, Have you seen any problems with the edema? Um, not yet. We're keeping an eye on it. Um, we don't think it's reached here yet. So, for those who don't know, um, one of the big reasons that uh, Acropora populations um, plummeted in the late in the 80s was because there was a huge diet of um, diadema as lararum, which is the long spined sea urchin. Um, basically, there was some mysterious disease that we don't actually still don't know what it was. Um, and they all just started dying off. At first, everyone was really, really happy because it was like, yay, we don't have to worry about stepping on sea urchins when we get in the ocean. And then suddenly they noticed that there was an awful lot of algae on the roof. Um, this is because Sea urchins might hide in nooks and crannies during the day, but 
But at night time, they're basically working those vacuum cleaners, um, eating up all the algae in the roots. So they're really, really important. Their populations have gradually started to um, recover in the past 40 years, but unfortunately, they have started out dying out again. And in places in the Eastern Caribbean, they've seen it in Dominican Republic, in Jamaica, I think, in Cuba, in Florida, thank you, Molly. Um, and uh, the Virgin Islands as well, they've started seeing it. Uh, it hasn't confirmed on the Mesoamerican Reef yet. We are keeping an eye on it um, because obviously this is really, really important. But uh, thank you for that, Dave. Uh, any more questions? Yes. How can we help? Uh, you can take the course and then come volunteer with us. <laughs> so basically, the course is not just a way of making money and educating people. Um, it's also what we ask. Excuse me. Um, it's also what we require our volunteers to have taken the course so that we can so. Um, we can ensure that um, all of our volunteers that are with us are fully trained and we know that they know how we do things in our nursery. Um, so if you want to come and help, uh, um, come take the course and then we can come with us on Wednesday mornings when we go to the nursery. Um, there's also options to um, volunteer with other different things, with, with the spawning monitoring and various different other projects, I'd recommend emailing volunteer at Rotan Rain Park and um, we can have a public conversation. <laughs> Any more questions? Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, guys. You've been wonderful. Uh, thank you for coming and listening to me practice on about corals for an hour. Um, I hope you've had a good time. If you haven't yet, could you please sign the, the attendance list? Oh, we have another question. Where is your nursery on that map? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Um, where is it on the this map? Um, Yeah, so that's, this is West, um, no, that's Gibson Bike. This is West End, right? So it's there. Grace, can we use your? Oh, uh, yeah, that might work. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, there's a lot of personal Zoom. <laughs> it's this one, it's like here. Yeah, Oh. Um, yeah, that's our Alpine site, actually, I think. Because one of one of our fragments of opportunity was actually from the outbound site. It's very tough. Um, it wasn't one of our outbound sites. Uh, yeah, so that's where it is. It's kind of halfway between halfway between West Bay and West End, and right there. So a uh, dive site that's super deep. Okay. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, guys. Um, have a lovely evening. Just stick around and try it.